Now, Judges 19, 20, and 21 is probably the most messed up story in the Bible. And I'm also going to explain to you by the end of the sermon why that story is in the Bible and explain that a little bit to you as well, give you some closure there. So, this morning, first of all, if we're going to figure out how that universe works, we have to give you a quick lesson in thermodynamics. Okay? So, thermodynamics is basically the study. I'm going to give you the technical definition of thermodynamics, and then I'm just going to explain it to you in layman's terms. So, basically, thermodynamics is the study of energy and work and, and the, basically the transfer of heat throughout the universe. Okay? Now, there's some laws in thermodynamics. There's three main laws of thermodynamics. Today, we're going to focus on the second law of thermodynamics. I'm going to use that. Um, to explain to you how the universe works. Basically, the three laws of thermodynamics are basically centered around the second law. So we're just going to focus on the second law for sake of time. And the second law of thermodynamics basically states this, is that the entropy of a closed system always increases. So you say, what in the world is entropy? Okay. The, the scientific definition of entropy is this. Entropy is the measure of a system's thermal energy per unit temperature that is unavailable for doing useful work. Because work is obtained from ordered molecular motion, the amount of entropy is also a measure of the molecular disorder or randomness of a system. Simply put, in layman's terms, entropy is the disorder of a system. It's a measure of disorder. It's a measure of uh, disorder in, in anything. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate for you, I thought I had a glass under here, here it is. So we need our handy glass of water, as I like to use a glass of water in just about every explanation it seems. But basically it's, the, the laws of thermodynamics, especially the second law of thermodynamics, it's not a philosophy. Okay, it's, it's a law. It's the way things work. And people have discovered this law. They put mathematical equations to it. Scientists use it. Engineers use it to design, design machines, to build buildings, all these different things. But it's something that's there. It's happening to us. It's how the universe literally works around us. Okay? So in order to design systems and machines and all these things inside this universe, you must understand these laws and how they work. Okay? That's why, in my opinion, some of the best engineers and scientists and inventors were people that actually recognized God, like Michael Faraday, for example, and they understood that the machines that they had to build had to operate within the limits that God had put forth to us on this earth. Gravity is a perfect example. When you build a building, you have to make it strong enough to withstand gravity, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work out so well. So, entropy is this measure of disorder, okay? And it doesn't just govern heat transfer, it governs the whole universe. So the second law of thermodynamics says that every system in the universe is always heading towards disorder, not the other way around. Okay? Some examples. I'm going to give you an example at a molecular level. I'll start at the molecular level and then we'll move up from there. So I have some blue ice cubes and a glass of water. And what I'm going to do is we're going to have a little object lesson here. So here I have some blue molecules in this ice cube. These are very stable molecules. They're not moving. They're formed in a certain way. There's no way I can move them. Okay? So I have this, now I have this glass of water, which is also the same substance, but it, the molecules are in a different form. It's very unstable. I can move it around. But what happens is if I put these two things together, if I put this blue stable ice cube into this water, the system of this glass is going to start heading into disorder. Okay, it's not going to get more ordered, it's going to head into disorder. So we're going to leave that there for the sermon, but basically the water molecules have much more disorder than the ice cube. Okay, so we're going to watch that system as the sermon continues. Another example on a bigger scale, we're sitting in a church this morning. If this church, so we had a New Year's Eve party, right? And we destroyed this place. I mean, we wrecked the whole place. But if this church, never got cleaned, the system of this church building, this church would head towards disorder. So as the closed system of this building, if there was never anything applied to make the entropy decrease, it would just get, the entropy of this building would just be more and more, and it wouldn't matter how careful we were. The things would wear out, 
things would break down, the floor would get dirty, things would get dropped, it would just get more and more dirty. So in order to decrease the disorder of a system, energy must be applied. Okay? So I created that ice cube because I applied energy to create that ice cube. Okay? So in order to have a clean church building, there's no magical button that I push on the wall. Somebody has to actually come in here and apply energy to clean the church building. Okay? Everything works this way. Everything in the entire universe. We could get bigger and bigger and bigger on the systems. And this is the physical world that we live in and how it actually works. So on a side note, the sermon's not about evolution, but basically evolution goes against the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, because what evolutionists will claim is that there's this spontaneous order that comes from nothing. And it goes against the second law of thermodynamics. You can say, oh, the, you know, there's energy applied and things like that, but they, they have, the evolutionist has no explanation for where the spontaneous order of organisms come from and how it gets more and more and more ordered as a small organism or a simple organism evolves into a more complex organism. There's no explanation for it. And it goes against the second law of thermodynamics. So engineers should not be evolutionists if they're thinking people. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, microevolution is a completely different thing. Okay? I used to selectively, we raised sheep and we raised registered sheep. Okay? And we selectively bred animals for certain traits. All right? So we would selectively breed our animals for a trait like growth. We wanted the lambs to put on a lot of weight every single day. So we would, that's a trait that we would look for and we would breed. But here's the thing, if you selectively breed animals, you lose other traits. So the entropy still increases. The disorder always increases, even in selectively breeding animals. There was always this argument between the show sheep people, who like to go and show sheep at the, the fair, and the production sheep people. Because you would have these show sheep people who bred this entire breed of sheep to have a straight back, and have certain legs a certain way, but the sheep became almost infertile. They, had, they, had, they lost all the other traits. So as far as production and making lambs that would grow for meat and things like that, these, this breed was completely worthless. So you still, even with selective breeding and, and you know, nature choosing certain traits, the species is still heading towards disorder. So it still disproves evolution. All right? So, we see that it's all heading towards disorder in the universe. Another thing, evolution, last thing in evolution, has no ex explanation for. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. This spark of life, they have no explanation for this mysterious spark of life that as soon as you as a person, as a human being, as an alive organism, lose this spark of life, look down at verse number 13. Genesis 3, verse 13, the Bible says, In the sweat of thy face, face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So there's this mysterious spark of life that they just can't explain where it came from. Okay, And as soon as you lose it, you begin to turn into dust again. That process begins, okay? So we see that everything is headed towards disorder. Let's get back to the second law of thermodynamics. Your body exhibits it. You're sitting in this room today. This room is about 69 degrees, 68 degrees probably. My wife's a little cold. But you sit in your chair at 98 degrees Fahrenheit. How is that possible? Your body is actually heading towards the temperature of this room. Did you know that? It wants to be at the temperature of this room, but you're going to go and you're going to get a little bit hungry and you're going to eat something and your body is going to convert that food, that energy that you brought into your system, into work and the, the work inside your body to keep your body at 98 degrees is going to continue and it, there's a waste product called heat. Did you know that your body puts out about 400 BTUs an hour? That's why at the Red Hot Preaching Conference we have an extra 100 people in the room we have to get a bunch of air conditioners because we've got 400 times 100 people's 40,000 BTUs that we need to replace. We need to remove from the building. 
Okay, because your body is a system, and it wants to, it wants to, just like the ice cube, it wants to head to equilibrium. I see that the water is getting a little blue. So we need energy to reduce entropy, to reduce disorder. Okay, you eat food and your, your body, that's the energy that your body uses. And it's a basic law that governs the entire world around us. So today I want to show you how it not only governs the physical world, but the spiritual as, as well. Okay, because look, who invented this law? Did some scientist or inventor or engineer from the 1500s or 1600s invent the second law of thermodynamics? Or the first, second, and third law of th thermodynamics? No, they just... They figured out how to work around it and to model it and to build things within it. It was invented by God. And it matches perfectly with what we see in the Bible. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So everything from the molecular level all the way up to the system levels like your body, this room, the entire universe is increasing in disorder all the time. And the only way to slow it or reverse it is to apply energy. Is everybody with me so far? That's the whole idea that we're going to head into right now, okay? Doesn't it make sense that since God designed the physical world, the way he designed the spiritual world would match what, what we see in the physical world? It's the same inventor. Look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 40. It's our verse of the week. The Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. That's the opposite of increasing entropy. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. I first want to, I want to start at the, at the level of the individual today when we talk about um, increasing or dis decreasing disorder and see what the Bible says. We talked about, in, turn to Proverbs 29. Center your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms, and then one book over is the book of Proverbs. So we talked about raising small children several weeks ago. Okay, and if you look at Proverbs 29... In verse number 15, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So the Bible here is teaching, and we talked about this when we were talking about raising small children, is that your children, if left alone, they will default to bad. Okay, isn't that interesting? Children will default, if you do nothing to intervene, they will default to disorder. Okay? It takes energy to correct it. Okay? It takes, I mean, and it takes literal energy to spank, to correct, to raise children properly. It takes energy from somewhere, from their parents, the Bible says. So why does a child default to bad? Why do individuals default to bad, especially children, as this, this verse is telling us. And I'm going to explain to you that because, that, number one, it's two reasons. And the first one is turn to Romans chapter 7. They're being influenced by two things. And the Bible tells us what those two things are. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. So if left alone... It will go bad. It will go into disorder, the Bible says. Look at Romans chapter 7 and verse number 23. The Bible says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now we could study this for a long time, but we went over this in Romans 7. Even if you're saved today, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, there's nothing you could ever do to lose your salvation, but as long as you're alive on this earth, the Bible teaches, as Paul says here, that you're going to be warring against the flesh your whole life. You always have the flesh with you. So that is one of the reasons that children will default to bad, because they have the sin nature of the flesh with them, okay? The second reason, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The second reason that children will default to bad is because they're being influenced by the world around them. Okay, it's not really a closed system if they're being influenced by the world around them that has defaulted to bad, and we'll get to that later. 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is why the Bible teaches separation for the Christian. Because that negative influence of the world will change you, and it will default you to bad. Okay, It will melt your ice cube, so to speak. You want your child's life to be a controlled system. The influence coming from the right sources. Okay? It's not a closed system, but you want the influence coming into their life in, from the right sources. Turn to Isaiah 53. So the point I'm trying to get you to understand is that the Bible teaches that left to ourselves, we will go astray. Isaiah 53. Look at verse number 6. And the Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse number 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, the Bible says. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the second law of thermodynamics in the Bible right there. People turning to their own way. Look, the Bible uses this example of sheep a lot. Sheep going astray. Sheep being scattered. To organize sheep takes an incredible amount of energy. I know. You have to build fences or they would scatter. You have to provide them shelter or they will just die. You know, you have to feed them. You have to treat them when they get sick. That takes energy. So children need their parents to keep them in order, to turn the tide of the sin nature in them and to isolate those negative sources that are trying to get into their life. Like the public school system, So we have this flesh, we have this sin nature, and also this world that's trying to default us to bad. You see? What energy source do we use? That's the question. We're talking about this from a perspective of thermodynamics, right? What energy source do we apply, turn to Galatians chapter 5, to stop the disorder from taking over our lives? Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'll give you some time to turn there. New Testament. Galatians chapter 5, look down at verse number 17, where the Bible reads, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that, are in, that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So the first thing that you have, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. The first thing that you have to help you fight against this disorder is the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing that you have. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 13. The Bible says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So you, if you are saved today, the Bible says that you have this Holy Spirit in you. You have this weapon already. It's what seals you. It's what makes, it guarantees that you can never go to hell. And the Bible says that you have this spirit that's warring against the flesh. The spirit against the flesh is what the Bible just said. The Holy Spirit is fighting a war for you. Will you help him? That's what's going on. The Holy Spirit is inside you warring against the flesh. The Bible says that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you can walk in the flesh and you can grieve the Holy Spirit that's in you, that's not going anywhere. But you can grieve Him. So you have this tool to stop 
the disorder in your life. And the first tool is the Holy Spirit. And He's with you if you're saved. Because the Bible says that after ye believe the word of truth, the gospel, that you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? Second, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. There's more. You have more than this. Proverbs chapter 1. Another thing that you have to help you fight the disorder in your life is you have wisdom and instruction. Look at Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 5. The Bible reads, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a, a, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's possible to be saved and be a fool. Okay? So the Bible is telling us here that our personal sources of energy are number one, the Holy Spirit, and number two, the Word of God. And we have them both, and they are unlimited. They are unlimited. So when it comes to your children, think of the ice cube. How's the ice cube doing? Not good. Think of the ice cube. Look, here's the thing. Once you've lost that ice cube to entropy of that system, there's no putting that ice cube back together. I can make another ice cube and apply, but it's very difficult to get that ice cube, get all those molecules back into that ice cube. And the same applies. It can be very difficult. If you lose your children to this world, it could be very difficult to pull them back. And it could mean that they never get saved if, somebody, if the wrong people get a hold of them in this world. So remember the ice cube when you think about your children. So that's the individual level. We see the second law of thermodynamics on the individual level, spiritually. It applies. It's God's law in the physical world, and it works for the spiritual world as well. It's what the Bible says. Let's look at the systems of a nation. The systems of a nation. Let's pull it back. Let's pull it out. The physical nation and the second law of thermodynamics. Look, I'm going to answer a, a, a big question for you right now. Do you ever wonder why there's always road construction? You ever go on a, a road trip with your family and you're like, why is there always road construction? It's because things wear out. Because things break. Because infrastructure is not forever. Because as soon as you build something, it starts degrading. It starts cracking up. Concrete cracks, asphalt cracks. Things, things don't get better over time. It's the second law of thermodynamics. That's what it is. Energy must always be added to put order back into those systems because everything tends towards disorder. Roads, bridges, power lines, equipment, it wears out. Your car, it wears out. That's why if you have a, you know, I love having a paid off car, but you know what? Things break and you have to put energy into those things and fix them. Think if you parked your car in a field for 50 years, would it get shinier every year? Of course not. Especially not here. <laughs> Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Now let's look at the spiritual aspect of a nation. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Look, Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this. Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 35, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they had fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Back to sheep. They need a shepherd. Left to themselves, they will go astray. Let's think about our reading this morning. Judges chapter 19, chapter 20, and chapter 21. One of those horrible stories in the whole Bible. You have a man whose concubine ran away. He went and got her back. And he went and he stayed overnight in this city called Gibeah. And all these sodomites and perverts tried to beat down the house and to like molest the men. And instead, these men, they offer their daughters. And then he finally throws this concubine out to this horde of perverts where they molest her and, and, and they kill her from it. Then he, he takes and he... I mean, it's a terrible story. 
He takes and he sends her body parts to the, the tribes of Israel. And all of Israel comes together to war against Benjamin, which is the tribe of where this, this town was. And they say, give us the men. They want, give us those sodomites so we can put them to death. Amen. They said. And they wouldn't do it. So what did they do? What did they do? They went to war against the entire nation. And they were to destroy the entire nation. Look, you'll see at the end, look at the end of Judges chapter 21. And if you wonder why these stories are in the Bible, it's, it's to demonstrate to you, look, here's another thing. When you're reading the Bible, this is a story. These, the, even the men that were in the city that were saying, take our daughters and all this kind, they didn't do the right thing either. Here you have a mob of sadistic, you know, unnatural perverts trying to murder people and molest people, and they're, you know, they didn't do the right thing either. You know, somebody comes to my house like that, and I'm going out first. That's the way it should be. That's what the Bible actually teaches. This is a story in the Bible. God didn't chime in until chapter number 20, where they said, should we go up? And God said, yes, go up and, and take care of it. That's when God chimed in, in chapter number 20. But look, the point I'm trying to make is this. Any serious historian, look at the end of Judges chapter 21. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that was what? That was right in his own eyes. They had just forsaken the law. So it gets even worse. So they go and they kill everybody in, in Gibeah except 600 men. And they're like, oh, now they felt bad for these 600 men. So they're like, well, these men are going to need wives. So they go and they, they find the tribe that didn't go to war with them. They kill a bunch of people up there, kidnap 400 women and give them to those guys. It's a terrible story. Nobody's doing right here. And then there's 200 women that they need. They're like, hey, just go kidnap them from these people. I mean, it's, but in the, at the end, at least the Bible explains to us that every man that was, did that was, was right in his own eyes. That's what happens when every man does what is right in his own eyes. You get a nation like this. Every serious historian knows this, that moral decline precedes the fall of an empire, of a nation. Anyone who has seriously studied history knows this, even the intellectual people out there. Let me read you, especially studies of the Roman Empire, by the way, which is crazy how well it mirrors what's happening in the United States. Let me le leave you, uh, read you a quote from Jim Nelson Black's book, When Nations Die. The Bible, or not the Bible, Jim Nelson's book says this, in Rome, entertainment grew bodier and more bizarre. Homosexuality and bestiality were openly practiced. Similar patterns can be found in other civiliza civilizations. In Greece, the music of the young people became wild and coarse. Popular entertainment was brutal and vulgar. Promiscuity, homosexuality, drunkenness became daily normal parts of life. And social restraints were lost, leading to even greater decadence. This is what a nation left to themselves will come to. Look at the Bible in Judges 19, 20, and 21. It's the same thing. Every man did that was right in his own, his own eyes. That's the second law of thermodynamics in the, in the Old Testament, is what that is. Maximum disorder. And that's why we read Judges 21 today. It's a story of how bad things can get and will get without a shepherd. Without the law. Without that external energy required to stop the disorder. Things in a nation will head towards maximum chaos, basically. You know, look, the energy to change it, to inject into the system, is God's law. It's the Bible. That's what the energy is. I mean, are we, we just studied Romans 13. Are we following the Bible today? What is the purpose of government in Romans 13? It's to be a terror to the evil. It says in Romans 13. That is what the government's job is. Is the government following God's law today? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a goofy thought to even say that with what's going on in our country. Look, 
God injected himself into the story in, the, in chapter 20, and I'm going to read it for you in, in Judges chapter 20, and verse 18. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. The Lord is telling them to go and take care of this. God ordered the destruction of Benjamin. God ordered, it's similar to Sodom and Gomorrah. God just took care of it. He just, he just wiped it out. So nations default to disorder. The second law of thermodynamics is happening to us in this nation today. It's happening. And look, God will only put up with it for so long. How many examples in the Bible do you need? God will only put up with it for so long. So let's look at the physical world now. Now that we see how nations will default to disorder. Let's look at the physical world. Turn to, turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Look, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that this physical world is dying that we live in. Luke chapter 21. I mean, environmentalists today will teach it's because we're destroying the earth, but the second law states that it's just happening. It's just heading towards disorder. Jesus said the same thing. He knew it too. Look at Luke 21 in verse number 7. And the Bible says, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall all these things be? Jesus, of course, is going to talk about end times things now. And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. I'm going to read you a quote from the World Health Organization. Infectious diseases are spreading around the world faster than ever, says the World Health Organization, and new diseases are emerging at unprecedented rates. This isn't, this isn't the Bible. This is the, the worldly World Health Organization. Several factors, and then of course they give us the answer, right? Several factors have accelerate the spread of disease around the world, increasing ease of international trade. Each you know, uh, year people travel more, population growth, resistance to drugs, under-resourced healthcare systems, intensive farming practice, and degradation of the environment. Basically, for the environmentalist or the liberal today, population control and you know, communism will fix everything. So, <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's just one more thing. But look, it's just increasing entropy on a global scale is what it is. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's increasing disorder. And get, guess what? As people get worse, and here's the problem if you don't understand the spiritual along with the physical. So if you're just studying and you're just some scientist or engineer who's just studying the physical world, you don't understand the spiritual. Well, here's the thing. As the entropy of the world spiritually gets worse and people in general gets worse, like in Judges 19, 20, and 21, guess what there's going to be more of? Wars. People doing immoral things at a national scale. There's going to be more and more of that because there's no morality bounding anybody. So you have to understand the spiritual to get the whole picture here. So luckily, let's get back to the physical system. All right, so the physical world is dying, but guess what? Luckily, we have this massive source of energy that's constantly injecting energy to the earth that God provided for us, right? You ever heard of this thing called the sun? Scientists today will teach that this second law of thermodynamics is going to end eventually with the heat death of the universe. Which means that, I mean, theoretically, I, I agree with it. The theoretical idea of it is that pretty soon there's going to be, not pretty soon, it's like 10 to the 26 years. It's like, you know, forever out there, right? But the idea is that there, as soon as there's no more useful energy anymore, we can't apply energy to stop the entropy anymore and everything will just stop basically. There's, you know, as soon as the, the sun burns out and all this stuff. But guess what? That's never going to happen. Right. You know, your bodies, you know, basically it's saying that you need all this energy to keep, you know, look at how many temperature differentials there are in this room right now. We have the room at 70 degrees. We have outside at 50 degrees or whatever it is. We have the refrigerator at 36 degrees. That all takes energy. As soon as there's no more energy, everything's just going to settle out at the same temperature. That's the heat death of the universe. Right? Theoretically, if there was, you know, not this whole thing called God that's controlling everything, 
you know, I get the point of that. But without the sun, everything dies, basically. You say, I can get a coat. No, without the sun, nothing grows. Everything dies. So luckily, God's provided this sun. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, in verse number 29. The Bible talks a lot about the sun. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 29. And Jesus says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The sun will be darkened. I mean, I don't believe it will go out. Otherwise, there would, you know, be no life left on earth. But there are things to come still after that happens, right? Talking about, you know, right before, you know, the rapture. Because, you know, that would basically kill the whole earth, according to the second law of thermodynamics. So there will be no heat death. Not that I don't agree with the theoretical possibility of it, but the point is that God will control the ending of this world. Amen. Okay? In Genesis chapter 8, 22, the Bible says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So we don't have to panic because God is controlling the ending of this thing. Okay? Now, Turn to Psalm 84. Here's where it gets really interesting. So we see the sun. God's provided the sun to give us, you know, the ultimate injection of energy into this earth that we're living on. Look at Psalm chapter 84. And we see that in the spiritual world, it's the Word of God and it's the Holy Spirit that's keeping us from disorder. Right? So we see in the physical world we have the sun, you know, giving energy to the earth. And we see in the spiritual world that we have basically God giving us our strength through the Holy Spirit and through His Word that He has perfectly pure words that He's preserved for us Amen. on earth. Look at Psalms, Psalm 84 and verse number 11. And look what the Bible says. This is interesting. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. So we see that the Bible compares God symbolically to a sun that gives us energy. And we see that it's through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in us. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. And we see at the end times when there's a new heaven and a new earth. We won't need a sun, the Bible says. We won't need a sun. Look at verse number 1. Revelation 21, verse number 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. You say, you know, you're making up this connection. No, the Bible makes the connection. It's right there. It directly compares God, our Savior, our life giver, to the sun. Amen. And it says that in, in the new heaven, in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem, we will not even need a sun because the glory of God will shine. Isn't that wonderful? The object that he created to keep us, keep us physically alive on this planet until the time he chooses is, is the sun. You know, look, nothing in the Bible is an accident. Nothing in the Bible, when you read Psalm 84 and you read that, you know, that he is a son to us. Nothing in the Bible is on accident. That's why we're King James only, because the actual literal words, individual words of the Bible matter. So when you start changing them, it makes mistakes. And it changes the meaning. So look, how's our ice cube doing? Not too good. So you see the physical world is heading towards disorder. Now it's all disorderly. There's not even any of it that's orderly anymore. It's all disorderly. Whether you like it or not, that's the way this physical world is heading. Whether you like it or not. You know, thankfully we have energy. You know, this massive injection of energy to the earth. We have the sun. We can, you know, grow food. It cleans water for us. It keeps the water cycle that we talked about going. The sun, with no sun, there's no water cycle. There's no evaporation. There's no condensation. The spiritual world operates under the same rules. 
And that's what the Bible shows us. We're being pulled into entropy. As a Christian today, as you're living in the world, as you're raising your kids in this world, you're being pulled into disorder. And you have the Holy Spirit fighting for you. Like I said earlier, will you give him a hand? Help out a little bit. You better recognize the danger of the world out there pulling on your children. Because it will get them. If you put them in public school and you put them in daycare and they never see you, the world's going to get them. That's why we push homeschooling here. That's why we push biblical education here. Because your children are going to learn a worldview. And the worldview of the world is the opposite of the worldview of this book. Right it's not a little bit different. It's the opposite. Amen. And they're being pulled into chaos. So you have to, you must intervene. If I want to make another ice cube, I have to intervene. I can't just say, will you please turn into an ice cube again? I have to inject energy to create that ice cube. And then I have to keep we had to bring the thing up in this, with this ice pack and this whole thing because as soon as we took it out of the freezer, it started melting. You have to constantly be injecting energy or the entropy of the world will drag you down. You understand? It's, it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle. So as we fall away from you know, our energy sources, you can't fall away from the Holy Spirit, but you can, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. If you never read your Bible, you, adult, you will, you will slip into disorder. I mean, God gave you the Word of God. Do you ever read it? Or you'll slip into disorder. We need the injection of God's Word in our lives, you know? or the sin nature in the, in the world around us will, will take us into disorder. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It applies to the Bible. It applies to your spiritual life. But guess what? God invented both. <laughs> so it makes perfect sense. We see that nations, when they leave the Word of God and descend into this immorality, they, de they decay and they die. Or God just destroys them. We see that. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's God's law for our physical world. It makes perfect sense that the spiritual world would, op would operate the exact same way. And that, folks, is how the universe works in 43 minutes.